Well, he really didn't want that role. Um, he didn't want the visibility, and it was it was really interesting because we had a discussion, and and I said that to him exactly. You should be president of the company, and I should be in the supporting role. And he said, No, I don't want that. So I said, Okay, I'll do it because. When we started franchising in particular, we had built eight stores in nine years, opening the first store in 1976 in Dearborn, and um, building those all in a wing and a prayer with no money. Back then you could actually finance um, water heater, well, you could lease water heaters and storefront signs. Today you can't do that. And there was a lot of leasing money available, so when we started franchising in 1985. Uh, we realized somebody was going to have to be the face of the company. And there were two reasons that I did it. One was because as a woman, we would get more visibility. Women were not visible in business back in the early 70s. And um, also, it, there was a possibility we might get some additional uh, advantages for getting obtaining money, SBA money for the company. And also, he just didn't want to do it. So it was, uh, it was a big transition for me because I had no public speaking um, experience and I was pretty shy and had gotten married a week out of high school and um, didn't really have a college education, so it was uh, pretty daunting for me at the time. I don't know as though at that time I envisioned where we were going, and so I, I just said to myself, you will be able to do this, and I did it. It wasn't really something that I thought, oh gee, I've had all this experience in the stores and, and I really know what I'm doing and I'm just going to take it forward and make it grow. Um, and I really didn't think about how big it would ever get, quite frankly. I just knew that I had to do what I had to do. I actually think it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, having family, um, my husband and I have separate roles. He's always been the finance guy, the guy that could take, if you were at a car dealership and you wanted to know the payment and he knew the price of the car, he could, he could quote the payment before the salesperson could put it on a calculator. So he's always been great with numbers. Uh, I've been more with um, operations better in seeing things the way they, they should be um, and also in uh, envisioning what I'm, I'm a great visionary I can see in the future what we should look like as well as see the flaws in and what we need to do to fix those things we have our own distinctive products. For one thing, we import roast flavor and package all of our own coffees, and um, we're very good at that. Our coffees, have we have what we call the right roast, because if you take a wonderful 100% Kona and you over-roast it, you lose all the qualities. Um, if you um, were to come to our store and buy a hazelnut coffee, you're gonna get coffee that not only smells like hazelnut, it tastes like hazelnut. And so we've distinguished ourselves by making our products very high-end and very unique. One of the things that we do as a coffee company that cares is um, we only have water processed decaf. Many other companies use chemically processed decaf. And um, we've just been very diligent about making sure that no chemicals ever touch our coffee. And I think that that's, in, that's important for our customers to know. Then the other thing too is we do carry some 100% pure Jamaican Blue Mountain coffees and 100% pure Kona coffees. I was just talking with somebody, I think 
think it was yesterday, he said, oh, I've got a Kona blend. And I said, you won't get a Kona blend here. It's 100% pure. And those have to have a special roast in order to bring out all the qualities that are uh, inherent in that coffee. Coffee's a lot like wine. It, if it's grown on a different farm, if it comes from a different country, it'll have a different um, moisture content. So our right roast process basically has to be adapted to bring out all the qualities of that coffee. And we do that every time we get new coffee in. We have to have test the roast to make sure it's the right roast to bring out those qualities. So that's, uh, that's been an important part of keeping our quality at higher than I think everybody else's is, but that's my personal opinion. And in addition to that, we, um, we do many things that are, uh, we were early in the process with, um, the, we were the very first people to in invent a dessert coffee beverage. Um, our first, actually it was before we opened our first store. Um, I knew it was the Pepsi generation and people didn't even like coffee. They don't like the taste of coffee because that's what they would tell me. I, you know, I like the smell but I don't like the taste. I'm not a coffee drinker. So before we opened the first store, um, I created in my kitchen a, what I call foo-foo coffee drink, which is today called a dessert coffee drink. And it was a hot spice viennese. It had to have special spices in it and be made with fresh brewed coffee and real chocolate and have be topped with whipped cream. And when people would come in, they'd say, you know, I like the smell of coffee, but I don't like the taste. I'd say, let me make you something. And I'd make them a hot spice viennese and I'd say, here, try this. And if you don't like it, don't drink it. And 99% of the time they said, wow, this is great. It doesn't even taste like coffee. So the transition between having, um, being on the forefront of having some of these dessert coffee beverages that people are now copying, I think that we still, we still remain on the forefront because we're always bringing in new things and creating some wonderful new flavors at every, through every season. And I think that um, you have to do that. And I'm really not worried about other coffee companies. We really just focus on what we're doing. Well, you have to distinguish yourself for one thing. Um, and I'm not sure it's all about how many units you have um, I think we've grown to a, a pretty nice size, a comfortable size, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in the future, but business is fluid and it changes. Um, we distinguish ourselves by being the coffee company that cares, and we do a lot within the communities. Because we're a franchise company, our franchisees get very involved in their communities. Um, we get very involved, um, not just uh, nationally but also locally. We have a great fundraiser program that's a lot like a Girl Scout cookie program only it's coffee and chocolate and tea. Perk up your fundraising with the Coffee Beanery fundraising system. Looking for a simple, profitable and tasteful way to raise funds for your organization? Does your sports team, cheerleading squad, school, church, or community service group need to earn extra money to support a special program or trip? The Coffee Beanery, a name synonymous with the world's best coffee, offers your organization a proven fundraising system. And people love it, and it's, it's really an interesting program because the communities benefit by half of the dollars that they um, bring in. And so, for instance, we have one local high school, that their football program was entirely paid by this fundraiser program. And additionally, it's a marketing program that pays for itself, gets our coffee in people's houses. They live with it for a month, and then they have to go buy it again. So they have to go back to the store to get it. So it's, it's just a great all-around program and it's wonderful to be able to contribute within each individual community where we have stores.
Well, it is pretty much done six months in advance. Um, and we do it here in our cupping room. We bring in flavors and um, taste them, and um, they get voted on which ones are the best by all the employees, and um, we choose the ones that actually come out on top. Sometimes it's only one, or in this case, I think coming up, there's three new ones for the holidays. And then the photographs get done, and uh, the food photography, the drinks get made, and training gets written for all the employees in the stores, and all of the marketing materials get made. And so it has to be done quite far in advance. I think most of that's ship, being shipped out right now for holiday. The big thing is having coffee. I mean, the fact that we are the coffee supplier um, helps not only us because we you know we we can do things quickly and but it also helps our franchisees because then they get exclusives in their stores and so that works really well for all of us we're really blessed with some great people um, Tammy our coffee head of roasting and distribution's been with us um, 20 plus years and I like having a woman in charge of that because women, excuse me to all the men in the world, women pay a little bit more atten attention to details. We're the ones that bake the cookies and don't want them to burn and, and I think that um, she does an awesome job with that and it's just, it's a team. Um, I don't know as though we do anything special. I do think that we meet quite often and, and discuss what's going on, so try to keep everybody informed with what's going on in the company and what's coming that's new. And just this week we had some candidates in for a franchise, for a new franchise in Texas. And everybody knew they were coming and everybody was kind of ready in case they came around and asked some questions. And we just have a great team of people. And I think coffee is an affordable luxury. It's um, at 12 or 14 dollars a pound. It's not like buying a hundred dollar sweater. So it's a very affordable luxury. And for the most part, sales have been somewhat steady. And in the stores where franchisees are doing a great job, they have their customer base. They're not going to lose those customers because they just give great service. Um, the place that we have had some challenges is in new stores with uh, franchisees that haven't built their customer base and um, they, they need a little bit more nurturing to try to help them to get, um, to get that mindset. And I, I think that um, the coffee business itself has, as you said, we've been in business over 30 years. So we've had a lot of economic ups and downs. We've had coffee is a um, agricultural product. So it's subject to um, hurricanes and all kinds of problems that, that can exist for an agricultural product. It can get a coffee bore, or, which is a disease. And, and so the pricing, of our, the product can vary um, considerably, but that's one nice thing about us being the roaster and the importer is we, we here weather some of the storms so that our franchisees don't have to, um, they don't have to weather quite as bad as some other companies. So you just keep going, you know, you just keep going. You, you have the tenacity and you just keep going because the only time you lose is when you quit. Like any football game, you know, it's that last play that can either make it or break it. And I just watched my grandson play football a couple of weeks ago and he's, he's at Hope College and it was the last second of the game that uh, his team, they threw the long pass to the end zone and they won. And it's, it's the same, you just keep going because you, you, that one next thing can make a winner of you. It 
in, in 1985 when we started franchising, it was always a dream of mine. I mean, obviously back then I'd seen McDonald's and Wendy's and, and thought that that would be a wonderful way to grow the brand across the country and, and um, just an exciting way to grow. Uh, additionally, franchisees helping them get in business for themselves and helping them to um, have an opportunity um, was something that I really wanted to do. And for the most part, it's worked out really great. I mean, we've had franchisees be with us 20 plus years. Some of them have retired and I miss them. You know, those, those first franchisees that were with us, we were we are almost like this just really small group that was just out there building the brand. Um, today, I think it's more difficult for franchisees, and it has been for uh, a few years because the economy has been a little bit more difficult, and prices of rents have gone up, and prices of food go up, and so I think it's a bit more difficult for them. So we try our best to help them with great programs. Um, we have uh, programs like we. It's called Fishbowl. It's a it's a um, social networking that sends out to um, customers uh, uh, special offers from every store and individually. And so we have a lot of programs that that help them. We have seasonal coffees. We have um, they have a presence on our internet. Um, there we rec. You know, we have the fundraiser program for them to run locally to get their name out. So we do a lot, but it's still, they've got to do it. They need to get involved locally in their communities. They need to be part of the Chamber of Commerce. They need to get their name out. And they need to realize that just because they have a franchise, you don't stand behind the counter and expect people to come in. And if you don't smile when they do come in, you know, their business isn't going to work. So it's, uh, it, it takes their efforts along with our efforts for them to be successful. Well, our first experience, what I call across the pond, which is the ocean, was with um, Warren Han, who is in uh, Guam. And he came to us and he said, it, and that's not really considered international because it's a U.S. protectorate, but um, he wanted to open a store. And so we said, okay, we're gonna, we'll figure this out. And uh, today he has four stores and he's been a great operator. And then, our, um, then we went to Korea and we had some challenges a lot of challenges and I think in going international for any company yeah especially if you're going to export to that country there's a lot to learn um, so I think you have, to, you have to work through those challenges and one thing I'll, I'll say is this year China has changed all the rules for importing products into their country and we've had the most difficulty getting products through um, customs in China. It's, it's amazing. So even though you work out all the processes and you get um, things running fairly smoothly, uh, it can change. And China's been challenging. But then if you go to Doha and Dubai, we have a great franchisee there. And they have, I think they have eight or nine stores. So. If you franchise in a country and it's done really well with great people, it can expand the brand tremendously. And I actually have this theory, and it's probably today it's probably difficult to think of that with all the, uh, with all the unrest that's going on. But coffee is a warm, friendly beverage, and if you can get the people in that country to drink that beverage and start to relate a little bit more to an American brand with a, uh, a positive attitude that maybe it's a big dream, but maybe coffee could change the way the world looks at, people look at, at each other in the world and bring a little warmth and a little bit more understanding. Of 
we really are the coffee company that cares. And we truly care about um, our franchisees, our customers, because without them, they don't need us. They don't need franchisees. So um, the product that the customers get, but then in addition to it, how they get it. And that's where the franchisees come in. And then participating in our communities and then offering very special, special, um, unique products to them that they can't get anywhere else. I have a, I had an experience. I was going to a president and CEO conference in um, Utah and uh, I was at the airport waiting for a bus and there was a pilot that was there and he said, where are you going? And we just started chatting and I told him and he said, well, who, who do you work for? And I said, I'm with the coffee beanery. He said, oh, coffee beanery, coffee beanery. He said, I love your hazelnut. And I said, okay, we're in Utah. I don't have any stores here. And I think he told me he was from, um, he was from a state that where, where we didn't have a store. And I said, where do you buy your coffee? Oh, I get it in Miami. And I said, oh, that's great. And he said, no, wait, let me show you. And he pulled out his wallet and he pulled out these coupons. The punch that he bought, he said, I'm ready for a free pound. And I thought, that's just a great story. So a lot of times I'll tell a potential franchisee that because it's so important that when they brew the coffee that it meets the standards and it's hot enough and it's brewed properly and it's ground properly because if you're in Miami or if you're in New York or if you're in Michigan it all has to taste the same and, and the customer is always the first, the first person that's going to get it and the first person that has to say yeah this is great. champagne taste on a beer budget. Well, when we're getting ready to do our first store, um, first we had to find a location and I looked for, we looked at a lot of places and then we were called by a regional mall in Detroit that was going to open a brand new mall. And so we, I walked in and it was, there, was no, there were no stores. It was a dirt floor and this great, gigantic, wonderful sculpture hanging from the ceiling and I could just see people and I could see our store. And so we signed a lease um, with the Taubman Company for a 10 year lease for $180,000. And then I, when we were leaving, I looked at my husband and he said, you know what we just did? Yeah, we just signed a, a lease for 10 years for $180,000. And I said, yeah, we better find the money to build this store because we don't have it in the checking account. So we went to a bank and they said, well, of course we took them our, our business plan on a napkin. And they said, no, I don't think so. We're not interested. And um, about the fourth bank, because it was in Dearborn, we went to a Dearborn bank. And so the banker, a uh, young guy, much younger than me, he sat back and he leaned back, put his, crossed his arms, put his feet on the desk and said, hmm, you got champagne taste on a beer budget. Go find another mall. Well, you and I both know we'd already signed a, a lease. There was no way we're going to find another mall. So what we did is we found another bank. We just kept going until we found a bank that would give us a loan. I have a couple messages, one of which is you don't necessarily need a college education um, to be successful, although I do believe that if you're able to go to college, you should, and that you should consider it a privilege, not something that you're owed, because nobody is owed a college education. You have to earn it. Um, also. Not, don't limit yourself, nor anybody else. If you're working with somebody, if you have a partner, 
or if you have a husband or wife or a child, don't limit them. Don't hold them back. Try to encourage them to be more than what they are. And then listen to people and treat them the way that you would want to be treated. And I think that comes a lot from my Dale Carnegie experience. I'm a Dale Carnegie graduate and I serve on their board. Or I had to take Dale Carnegie because I couldn't say my name in front of anybody. Um, was so that I could take a leadership role in the company and, and take a visibility leadership role in the company so that we, I could be the president of the company and as a woman get a lot of PR and it really did work. We were in Success Magazine, Entrepreneur, I did win Entrepreneur of the Year um, and utilizing that as a tool to grow the company was an amazing thing. Dale Carnegie helps individuals realize their potential and businesses grow their people. It's an awesome combination, Dale Carnegie and franchising together. It's been a real stretch and privilege for me to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, I've served on a lot of boards and I think that that's helped my business as well. Um, I was on the board of directors for uh, Specialty Coffee and ultimately president of that association. And also the International Franchise Association. I was the first woman chairman of that association. And you can picture, that's where there, there's a board of like 30 some people. And when I first went on that board, I was the only woman. Um, so it's, don't limit yourself. Don't think you can't do something. Although um, the day that they called me to be, uh, move into the chairs and move up to chairman, um, we're in Chicago at some kind of conference and I remember I got down on my knees and prayed just that I would do a good job because I wanted to represent women um, being the first woman I wanted to do a great job and, and um, help the organization to grow and I was able to do that so that was pretty cool. National Franchise Association, so many of the people there have started, um, Great American Cookies started in their garage and um, just with a cookie recipe. And I think Mrs. Fields did as well. And Dunkin' Donuts, um, the founder of Dunkin' Donuts, started with a, a, a catering truck. And so those, those experiences and meeting those people and getting to know them and learning, um, actually, um, the founder of Dunkin' Donuts had a seventh grade education, and that's all. But when he, when Bill Rosenberg sat in those board meetings and spoke, he was brilliant. So it, it, it's truly been an amazing experience for me, and a real, another real blessing in my life, and it's been good to be able to share some of that. We want to continue to grow, but we want good, healthy growth. Um, we want, we're, we're doing a lot with current franchisees right now. Um, many of them are expanding their number of units. Um, internationally, we just opened in Lebanon, and that's exciting. And I, um, It's possible we might have something going on in London. So uh, I see that we'll just continue good, steady growth and we'll continue to get the brand out as much as we can. And the, the main thing is you want good, solid locations and solid franchisees, high traffic locations. And so we're being a bit more picky and, and trying to choose the, the right franchise partners to work with. Beautiful Flushing is just that. And Michigan is one of the best states in the, in the country. Um, I travel a lot and people complain about the weather here, but I, I can tell you from experience, the weather can be bad other places as well. And we just have a great workforce. I don't have to deal with a lot of traffic. I like that. Um, 
and it's just, it's, it's a good place. It really is. Um, and I think the governor is doing a great job. We've been happy about that. And Michigan starts, uh, obviously, the, they're getting the budget under control and, and things are starting to turn around here, just as they are in some other states. But um, I am, I'm happy with what's going on in Michigan right now. So uh, hopefully, there won't be, you know, progress will continue to be made. And I, that's what I see. I hear lots of great things. I think the very first film was Deep Impact. That was a few years ago. And Aaron Brockovich, we had a lot of exposure in that. Million Dollar Baby, so we've been in some Academy Award winning films and that's been exciting. Bobby P's not gonna like that. He likes his coffee hand brewed. Hmm. Well, maybe there's a coffee beanery we could go to before he gets here. If you don't take care of your own self, health-wise, nobody can do it for you. Um, you have to eat right, and I work out three days a week at a gym. Um, I actually work out with a bodybuilding trainer, which is probably not something you would think I would do, but I can do 20 push-ups on the floor. No, actually, 30 on the floor, I can do 120 at one time. and. Um, uh, I think that's a pretty good example for young women that uh, are maybe eating wrong or not taking care of themselves, not getting the exercise that they need to. Uh, and you can start at any age. Uh, through my life, I've always done something, but um, mostly, most recently, I started working out at the gym pretty seriously for about the last two years. and. Before that, I had all kinds of aches and pains, and now they're gone. I, except when I get what I call Jimmy sore because my trainer's name's Jimmy. And uh, but that, I, I say that I'm okay. I'm Jimmy sore, and it'll be gone in a day, <laughs> and it usually is. Well, we have two grown sons um, and nine grandchildren, so. I know, much to my son's chagrin, 
Um, I told them most recently, I'm not planning on going anywhere. Uh, I'm healthy, I'm young, um, I like what I'm doing, and, and I really, I don't think I've accomplished everything I really want to. And so you're gonna be stuck with me for a while. And they're great guys, they really are. They, they work with us, gosh, since they were nine and 11. Um, that's when we opened our first store. That's how old they were. And um, so I don't know if they mind. I, I, haven't, I haven't really asked them if they do mind. I think that they're trying to take some of the pressure off of me, and I, that's okay. I, I think that's a good thing. But um, there's still a lot to do, and they, they kind of they have this football um, analogy. They both used to coach football and one played offense and one plays defense. And what that means is the oldest son does all of the outside sales, franchising, and um, he operations, everything outside the building. And the other one does um, defense, which is internal, running the, the roasting plant and making sure that the coffee comes and goes and helping make sure that Tammy has what she needs when she needs it and things get done um, as they need to get done. So it's, it, they, they actually have pretty good roles for each of them. And my husband did ask to talk about retiring at one point <clears throat> and I said, okay, stay home tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And I said, when you decide what you wanna retire to, we'll talk about it and he never, he stopped talking and he keeps coming in the office. So I think people can be far more productive for a lot longer than what they think. And there are people that want to do other things and God bless them, they need to do what they need to do. But I love the coffee business, I love what we do, I love helping people and um, as long as I can, I'm gonna do it.